welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. What is ideology? And what does it mean to have an ideology? More than that, what do the political scientists and political philosophers and political theorists whose work involves the study of ideology, what do they understand it to mean? What are they searching for when they look at opinion poll data or historical text? What underlying conception is animating their work? I think this is a really interesting question, and it's one I've touched on before on the podcast. I recently read, there was recently done a really good um, overview study of all of the different work that's been going on in ideology over recent years, looking at what's been happening in a range of different disciplines and from a range of different countries. And the authors of that study are Matto Mildenberger and Jonathan Leder Maynard. I was fortunate enough to be able to get on the podcast to talk about their work. So, Much like the study they did, what we're aiming to do in this episode is provide an overview of everything that's going on in the study of ideology, and then more concretely get to the bottom of the question, what is ideology? Or perhaps better put, what are the different conceptions of the concept of ideology that are motivating scholars in a variety of different fields, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of those different conceptions. So this, as you know, long-term listeners will know, is sort of very related to topics that I'm really interested in, and I hope you enjoy listening to this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. So just by way of introduction, Matto Mildenberger is Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of California. His research explores the political drivers of policy inaction in the face of serious social and economic threats posed by climate change. Straddling comparative political economy and political behaviour, Mildenberger's work focuses on comparative climate policymaking and the dynamics of US climate opinion. His current book project compares the politics of carbon pricing across advanced economies with a focus on the history of climate reforms in Australia, Norway and the United States. Other ongoing work explores the public environmental behaviours, political ideology, and relationships between economic and environmental policy preferences. A previous book, Dependent America, How Mexico and Canada Construct US Power, in 2011, explored the political economy of the North American trade and security relationships. Jonathan, by contrast, was calling in from the other side of the world, from Oxford in the UK. Jonathan completed his undergraduate degree in War Studies and History at King's College London, and then moved to the University of Oxford to do an MPhil and DPhil in politics. He then worked as a lecturer in politics and international relations at St Anne's College, and is was a Rank Manning Junior Research Fellow in Social Sciences at New College. He's now a departmental lecturer in International Relations and is also a lecturer at New College. His work focuses particularly on the role of ideology in conflict and violence, as well as in genocide studies. So let's get straight to the interview. I have two really good guests on, and I really appreciated their time and this conversation. As a quick just note on this episode, one of them was calling in, I believe, from some sort of public cafe. So there was a tiny bit of background noise. I got some of it. There's still some of it left on, but it's not at all anything that would affect your appreciation of what they're saying. And indeed, there is a long history of political theorists meeting to discuss such topics in coffee houses. So just appreciate it in that light. So without any further preamble, it is my absolute pleasure to bring you my conversation with Matto and Jonathan on what is ideology? Mm-hmm. 
today by Jonathan Leader Maynard and Matteo Matto, sorry, Mildenberger. Matto, Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. <laughs> um, so, um, starting with um, with no preference at all, uh, Jonathan, um, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself and what, what sorts of things do you write about and are interested in? Yeah, so I think of myself as a political scientist, although I draw on a lot of different disciplines in my work. I'm based at the University of Oxford. And I work on a mixture of things to do with ideology, but particularly the role of ideology in political violence and conflict and armed conflict. Um, I'm particularly interested in sort of how is how our ideology is used to justify forms of extreme political violence, such as atrocities. But, you know, I also do more work on ideology more generally. So that's my kind of area of interest. Cool. And Matto? Yeah. So, so I'm Matto. Uh, I am assistant professor of political science at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, broadly, my work focuses on environmental politics. Uh, I study the, the political barriers to climate policy action and why we see this uh, really significant gap between the severity of the climate threat uh, and an anemic political response, both here in the U.S. and around the world. And, and, and part of that research involves thinking quite carefully about ideology, um, about people's uh, belief structures, and, and trying to understand how, how people come to understand the the policies that society faces and and how that shapes their behavior great so i've been really excited for this conversation because i'm really interested in political ideology how did um the two of you have written a few things together right just like giving general overviews of um what's going on in the study of ideology how did that come about well, I could probably start with this. I mean, Matto and I met through a broader project, really, based at, then at the University of Waterloo, that was to really looking at the role of ideological change, particularly in conflict in general. That can be in the area of climate or it can be in the area of violent conflict. And so we met via that, both having done some sort of survey work on the field of ideology. And it seemed appropriate us for, to, for us to kind of combine that work together and actually try and do a big survey, there hadn't really been any big published surveys of research and ideology out there for a long time. There had been some, you know, a few decades ago or a decade and a half ago, but none particularly recently or that were particularly interdisciplinary. And we seemed in a good position to do that. So yeah, Matto, does that sound like a good summary? Yeah, I think it does. I, I mean, I think uh, obviously Jonathan's based in the UK, I'm based in North America. Uh, and through the conversations we're having, we just realized how much more was going on in this field um, on sort of both sides of the Atlantic, but in a way that that wasn't really being covered or appreciated or read um, across the ocean. And so this is sort of a, a moment for us to put down on paper what we were discovering in our conversations, which is that, you know, there's a lot that was really exciting that I had not heard about and that wasn't really part of the, you know, political science conversation here in the U.S. and, and vice versa. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think we, we drew from this convening at the University of Waterloo and the chance to meet one another and then realized that that conversation was really fertile and, and had a potential to, to help us rethink how ideology is being studied across the world. Okay, great. Um, before we get to, like, you know, the divides that you just referenced in the study of ideology, um, you also both talked about, like, studying ideology, I guess you could say, is like a causal variable. Like, what is the role of this thing in explaining, just from the examples you mentioned, why we have conflict or why we don't have more meaningful action on climate change? Um, what would you say, what would be your, like, opening pitch for, like, I mean, it's a good question to start with, right, just why study ideology at all? Um, why, why be interested in this from whatever methodological approach is an object of analysis? Yeah, I guess from my perspective, I mean, it, it, that's a complicated question, and I think there's a lot of different answers that could be given to it. I suppose, for me, I come from what in sort of social science is often called a constructivist perspective. So I think that people's behavior in politics is very heavily affected by the kind of frameworks of meaning and ideas through which they understand the political world around them. I think the key thing, that's not really enough on its own, I think, to be interested in ideology. I think ideology has to be based around the idea that you think that those frameworks are often organized into systems, albeit pretty 
loose and inchoate systems a lot of the time, and also that they're patterned across groups. So it's not just that everyone has a completely unique sort of framework of understanding about politics of all of their own. Actually, people tend to draw on a certain sort of like set of, um, you know, I think there's a lot more different kinds of ideologies that matter in the world than, than some of these kind of big ism labels like liberalism, conservatism, socialism, etc. would suggest, but nevertheless, that there are patterns. There are patterns across groups in the ways that they think about and understand politics. And ideology is a kind of way of getting a handle on those patterns, on those sets of frameworks and ideas that people sort of necessarily rely on in making, in interpreting the world around them and in making decisions in that political world. Yeah, so I, I, I'd echo what Jonathan said, uh, uh, but to add that I also think we have a lot of evidence now that these frameworks of meetings are very consequential to important political decisions. Um, and so it's not only that there are these assemblages of ideas and, and networks of meaning that people are using to engage in a necessary way with politics, uh, but we really cannot understand some of the major political problems that are shaping the world today without understanding those those frameworks and, and those networks of meanings. And so, you know, I really think that understanding ideology is often a, a critical step in making sense of many of the big political challenges which we're facing both, you know, in individual countries, but also around the world. Yeah. And so before we get into this proper, I guess one thing you always have to do at the beginning of any discussion of ideology is to sort of begin by either disavowing or acknowledging um, the generally pejorative sense in which it's talked about in contemporary discourse, in popular discourse, and also in a lot of academic discourse, in that people want to say something is quote-unquote non-ideological as a way of saying that it is presumably, by contrast, therefore, rational, reasonable, non-contentious, something like that. Um, and, I mean, my take on that and you can tell me um, if I'm getting it wrong, is ironically, I think it's sort of a function of ideologies themselves, is that ideologies generally, with some exceptions, important exceptions, often don't see themselves as an ideology. So the classic would be um, Marxism views ideology as a sort of after the fact, um, rationalization of an underlying oppressive social structure, but it doesn't view itself as a as a competing system of ideas. It views itself, um, at least in some forms, as sort of correct and objectively true in some sense. And I think you see that to a greater or lesser degree in um, a lot of political discourse across all domains. Is that People don't want to recognize their political thought systems as having the same features that they more, much more clearly recognize in others. And as a result, we're sort of stuck with a very negative view of ideology and actually of the the political more generally. Um, and let's start with matter this time. Yeah, so um, I, I think this is a really important point. Um, and the the fact that there's a sort of popular pejorative meaning associated with ideology or a usage of ideology ha has been in some ways a big barrier um, for for several decades to the empirical study of ideology. I know that uh, you know the the really important American anthropologist Clifford Geertz, uh, you know, discussed uh, the ideology as a, an egregiously loaded concept, and really we sort of see two different movements away from that pejorative usage um, in different communities. So I think beginning after the Second World War on the American politics, American social science side of things, there was actually a fairly rapid move away from studying ideology with sort of this pejorative meaning in mind. And, and there was this real pivot to thinking about ideologies as being a, a a group of ideas that should be studied empirically. Um, I think that that move from treating ideology as this pejorative concept to treating it as a sort of an objective object of empirical scrutiny uh, was a bit more uneven in Europe. Uh, and uh, the, the effort to think about ideologies in a more sort of empirical way uh, proceeded pretty rapidly in some communities and a bit 
it lagged a bit in other communities. But I think over the last couple of decades, there's really been a convergence here where we're now most, if not all, of the major thinkers and scholars of ideology um, in a range of different traditions all see ideas and frameworks as meanings as being some part of the world that we should be studying um, and sort of a natural part of the way that people process information and make sense of the world. And this, this earlier pejorative notion of ideology that was so framed by um, you know, the type of isms like fascism and, and the really turbulence of early 20th century politics um, has faded. And in many ways, this has freed scholars up to, to think much more creatively and thoughtfully um, about ideologies, as we, as Jonathan and I have written about. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I completely agree with everything that Matteo just said. I mean, I think I would just add a couple of points, but one of which is I think one of the reasons why people have moved away from the critical sort of pejorative meaning of ideology is actually realizing that we don't need the concept of ideology to be intrinsically pejorative to be able to engage in meaningful ideology critique. Um, the, the really major discourse theorist of ideology, Tian Van Dyck, makes this point very explicitly and, and analogizes it to power. You know, a lot of people are interested in the notion of power because they want to analyze power abuse or various problems associated with concentrations of power. But that doesn't mean that you need to define the concept of power as always being bad. And similarly, we can have the view that lots of ideologies are, are bad, they have negative effects, but that doesn't mean that we need to define the notion of ideology as intrinsically uh, negative. The only thing that you really, the only reason why you would need to define ideology in that way is if you want it to be the case that every time you say, ah, oh, well, that's very ideological, it automatically means that something is, is, is negative. And I, I don't think that's actually a very persuasive form of critical reflection. The, the other thing I would say, the other thing I would just add, one other important point, I think, is that, you know, although I very much agree that there is this kind of pejorative usage of ideology around, I do think it's important to recognize that there isn't really any kind of stable meaning of the word ideology out there in kind of ordinary lay discourse. Because, of course, alongside that tradition of people being like, oh, that's, you know, that's very ideological. I don't approve of that. We should just be pragmatic or you know, alongside that kind of discourse, of course, we've all also seen school textbooks that regularly talk about liberalism, socialism, conservatism, you know, as completely normal parts of the ideological world. And those are not meant to be intrinsically negative concepts necessarily. They're kind of maps of our, of our you know, political worldviews that exist in ordinary society amongst everyone. So there's always been this kind of simultaneous existence between these two different notions of ideology, one quite neutral and one quite pejorative. Right. And I think that so, you know, I think that there, there's also been pretty substantial um, developments in the last 30, 50 years in both scientific and popular understanding of human psychology, human cognition, human affect. Uh, and, and all of those debates have, you know, increasingly emphasized how important people's mental models, understandings of the world, the way in which the human mind filters and processes information from the world according to different routines. And, and I think that that increased understanding of the, the, the cognitive mind, the emotional mind, and, and the way in which our brains act as these information filters have also contributed to, in at least popular understanding, a sense in which ideologies and, and ways in which mental models filter information from the world is a natural way of human interaction with, with politi political debate and, and politics, rather than some necessarily negative or pejorative um, way of being. There's one final element I'd like to put on the table here, which is I think even, I think amongst political th people who think politically and at least claim to do so in a fairly rigorous way, there's a sort of fear, and I think it's often almost like partly subconscious, although once you get right down to it, I think what a lot of people are afraid of in using ideology in a more uh, neutral way is like Jonathan said that there's that, that that will open up a trap door to just a sort of soft moral relativism and you know I had a back and forth on another podcast a while ago with um a philosopher um 
and sort of constantly pushing back on my describing ideology in Michael Frieden's terms as um, competitions for the control of political language, different um, sets of conceptions linked together. And what it really came down to is he wanted to know, but can I still be a moral realist and accept everything you're saying? And yes, I, I mean, I think broadly, yes, right? Just because you're creating a map doesn't mean that there isn't a place in that map that you want to stand and defend. I think if you really got into the epistemology of that, it might be a little bit more complicated. But then, like, it would you'd have to really get down to nuts and bolts and be like, what particular, specifically, model of ideology are you using? And what specific um, meta-ethics are you trying to defend? And, you know, there, there, we won't get into it here. You could really go into, like, what is the deep compatibility there but on surface face value there's nothing i don't think about describing ideologies in a more neutral way that implies that sort of hard relativism but that really does seem to be the fear that people have of it yeah i, I mean I, I see that a lot i mean but i think but like you i think it's a mistake you know i think the, the key thing i think we should focus on here is that to be the, really, the fundamental interest in studying ideologies is to be interested in disagreement, right, or difference between groups. And there's nothing about studying disagreement or the differences between how different groups see the world that commits you to the view that there is no truth about the matter, right? You may well think that some of these ideologies are right and some of them are wrong, or some of them are more accurate and some of them are inaccurate. Indeed, I would definitely say that that is the case. Many ideological views are completely fantastical and absurd, and some of them are, you know, much more respectable and grounded in evidence. But I think that, you know, what we're committed to in studying ideologies is to think that there are these differences and disagreements, that it's not all so self-evident, that everyone just immediately agrees about, about things. You know, it, it, it is the disagreement that interests us and that makes ideologies worthwhile studying. But that's not to, you know, commit yourself to the idea that they're, you know, all of them are equal. I don't see any reason why we should think that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, different ideologies can have different connections with empirical reality. Some are more grounded in reality. Some are less grounded in reality. Um, some are going to be more functional in helping people navigate the world as it is. Uh, you know, some, some are going to hold belief. You know, some ideologies will contain beliefs that are easily disproven or, or run into substantial empirical observed inconsistencies very quickly. Um, but studying that and understanding the distribution of beliefs in the world. Um, you know, is not making a, a judgment or a claim that uh, those beliefs, because they exist, are somehow equally valid. Yeah, and I know it seems like we're belaboring this, but I feel like we've all run up against that wall, it, probably in quite different ways, given, you know, different career trajectories or whatever. But yeah, for sure, for sure. And, and, also, and also, sorry, Toby, to interrupt, I mean, it's yeah, saying, go ahead. It, it was very important to an earlier generation of ideology theorists, you know, the, the, it's not a ridiculous question, I mean, I, I think we've now moved past it, but, you know, there were these huge debates now completely lost to most scholars because we don't, they're not important anymore, but, but these huge debates in the sort of 60s about how you distinguish ideology from science, and our, our modern conception of ideology that are more neutral just don't need to, you know, they don't need to weigh into that. They're, they're, it's perfectly possible that science may be a big part of some ideologies and that indeed some scientific propositions might be quite ideological in many ways. But, you know, so we're not forced to make that distinction anymore. But people were in the past. It was a big part of the history of thinking about ideology, even if now we sort of moved away from that debate because of this slightly broader, more neutral way in which most people uh, in scholarship at least tend to be talking about ideology. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. And so, OK, so let's go on to the next step of like, what is ideology? Because it seems to me that you have like 2.5 broad approaches to this and they exist really um, without almost any reference to each other whatsoever. So approach one would be that which informs most empirical work of ideology, which is ideology as a spectrum of policy preferences. So at its simplest, you would have like a left-right spectrum. You could also um, add multiple dimensions, so you could have left-right economic and left-right social. Is I mean, I actually think that one makes a certain amount of sense. Um, that's approach one, and 
in my head, I just call that a dimensional model of ideology because you're, 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 it's just lines on a graph is how it's most commonly presented. The other one would be, um, I would most associate with Michael Frieden, but he's, I would say, emblematic of a, a more general approach, which is ideologies as sort of sets of ideas, as clusters of concepts, and how that appears to us on the page is very different. That it, it tends to appear to us on the page as big blocks of very dense text. And then the point five would be um, what Matto referenced, which is um, psychology, and a lot of the results there are beginning to have things to say about how emotions like disgust, fear of death, um, a whole bunch of others, um, often inform and underpin, or just in some sense correlate with, our political preferences. Um, and so you've got those three sort of approaches, um, and as, which are studying the same object of inquiry, but are grounded just physically in different institutions on both sides of the Atlantic, and are not sharing insights at all. Am I, tell, am I getting that characterization wrong, and what would you want to build off that? Well, let me say one thing, and then I'll let Jonathan um, speak more broadly, particularly to the non-dimensional approaches to the study of ideology. Um, you know, I, I think one way that I have tended to um, think about this sort of uh, organization of communities is in thinking about sort of dimensional versus non-dimensional, or as, as Michael, or as Jonathan and I have written, spatial versus non-spatial approaches to conceptualizing ideology. Um, and and I think the that there certainly is this gap in trying to understand you know are ideologies coherent or incoherent sets of policy preferences or beliefs that can be mapped into some sort of multi-dimensional uh, possibility space or or do they have uh, you know some type of understanding that's grounded more in political theory or discourse analysis where, uh, you know, the ideologies are concepts and configurations of concepts that don't have any clear sort of spatial uh, conceptualization. I tend to think that to the degree that psychology has contributed to debates over ideology in the last 10 or 15 years, um, it's tended to actually speak quite closely to and contribute to this dimensional or spatial way of thinking about ideology. Um, and so the, the, the psychological and cognitive psychological ways of thinking about ideology have fit really well with and um, been in very close dialogue with earlier traditions that have tried to map you know, the, the two or three dimensions of belief structures. Um, but I definitely think that that conversation between psychology and the earlier traditions of spatial ideological thinking um, is still happening in, in comparative isolation from this non-spatial, you know, more intellectual history, discourse analysis, understanding of ideology that, um, that's represented by Frieden um, and, and a lot of really, really dynamic thinkers in Europe. Yeah, I mean, I, that's totally right. And I, I, mean, I think one of the reasons why there's that divide that Matt has just described is because it's probably worthwhile pointing out that these distinctions are not, I think, really disagreements for the most part. There are some elements which could, could reflect genuine substantive disagreements. But the truth is, is that sort of most of the people using dimensional approaches are really engaging in a very different kind of social scientific inquiry than most of the people who use non-spatial content-based um, sort of descriptive, often often using sort of large prose text descriptions of ideologies, those kind of approaches. Indeed, many of the latter group would not even see themselves as social scientists. You know, they might be political theorists who don't think of themselves as doing social science or even historians or um, literary theorists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to some degree, they're doing different things. And there's a big difference between whether you really want to sort of understand the deep, detailed content of an ideology um, with whether you want to kind of causally test, particularly through statistical methods, whether you can kind of show some correlations or in, in, gain some causal leverage through statistical analysis over the effect 
that ideologies have or the things that affect ideologies themselves. Those are two very different kinds of inquiry. And the dimensional model is very, very helpful for that kind of statistical approach. It's not only used in statistical approaches, but it, but it is useful for, for that. Um, if you want to get into really understanding the intellectual evolution of an ideology, why certain ideas have been modified in certain ways, it's much harder to use a statistical approach for that kind of question. So to a large degree, I think these different ways of thinking about ideologies are not they don't need to be in contrast. Really, they can be just seen as different kinds of tools for studying ideologies in different kinds of ways. Yeah. Um, so, I'm, okay, so I maybe was too strong in saying um, that they're, you know, two very different methodologies, even at some points epistemologies, for studying the same thing. That's too strong. They're not studying the same thing. I would, though, make the case that the object of study in both cases, th those, th those two respective objects of study, are much more mutually informing than is commonly taken for granted, and this goes to this big question of, like, where do ideologies come from, and why do, you know, people who don't consider themselves especially political nonetheless have political ideologies? And I'm not going to try and give a full answer to that, um, but we all are walking around with normative judgments about the world in our head. They may be subconscious, but they're nonetheless real. The example I always give is um, if you're told in a job interview all the women can leave, um, this is just for men, you know that's unfair. You know it's unfair without having to consult a consciously held theory. And even people who do hold consciously held theories the, the, the realisation that it's unfair comes before they consult that consciously held theory. So we're all walking around with this. And um, as you said, Jonathan, at the beginning, the way in which we hold those often subconscious normative evaluations of the world exhibits some clear patterns, even if those patterns aren't perfectly um, logically consistent. They're there, right? And so they, they come from somewhere. Um, and where, because they're non-uniform, so where do they come from? And a big part of it surely must be the thing that the political theorists are studying, i.e. the, um, the history of thought and, like, how these things developed and, um, you know, and you can study John Stuart Mill for, like, is he technically morally right, whatever that might mean. You can also just study it as how does he use language and how has this informed the world and and built the world, including built the minds that exist within the world. That that was a little long there, but that, that's more where I'm driving at is not that it's the same object of study, that is wrong, but that those objects of study are much more tightly bound up with each other than I think is often talked about by people within either. I'll, I'll let you Riff off that, or tell me why I'm wrong. Uh, shall, I, shall I go, Matto? Um, yeah, go. I mean, I, I mean, I, I actually, I actually think, I, you know, I think what you said originally was right, Toby. I think it is the case that actually they're studying the same object, but I think they're asking different questions about that object. So actually, a lot of these people agree with each other about what ideology is, and they're all, in a sense, studying. Let's just call them distinctive political worldviews for shorthand. Um, but the but the questions they're asking about them differ. And the methods they have for studying them differ. And as I say, the being interested in, say, for example, you know, the intellectual evolution of an ideology or the very subtle meanings, actually deeply understanding those subtle meanings uh, that you were sort of mentioning that guide the moral intuitions of different thought systems. That's a very different question from studying, you know, where they come, what determines them? Why do some people get attached to one worldview rather than another? Or what, how does one worldview affect the behavior of a certain group in engaging in violence or something like that? You know, those are just different kinds of questions, but they are being asked about the same kind of object. They're all talking about political worldviews. I mean, again, there are subtle differences between the conceptual understanding of ideology between different groups. But I would agree that the fundamental thing that they're all studying is pretty similar. It's, it's, it's that the questions they're asking about that, that thing are, are, are different. Right. And, and that was not always the case. And, and so in my mind, one of the really mm, interesting... Yeah sociology of knowledge points that we can take from, from the study of ideology is that the, there's been a real convergence in the co in what the overall object of study is. So I agree entirely with what Jonathan said, that 
there's very different methods that are very different epistemologies that are, are studying ideology and thinking about it in, in very different ways. Um, but there's a lot more convergent compatibility with the findings and thoughts and, and results of these very different research programs um, today than there was 20 or 30 years ago. And, and I think, Toby, this is something that you said a, a few minutes ago, and I think it's absolutely right. That that just suggests, and not just suggests, I mean, I do think that there's a lot more opportunity for scholars working in very different spaces who, who may have very different epistemological commitments to be reading and engaging with each other's otherwise very different work and recognizing that different questions are being answered with different methods, but those questions and the, the findings from one study can actually really inform and enrich the the research in a very different tradition. And so Jonathan and I both, you know, see a lot of promise and potential for a much more rich interdisciplinary, you know, between epistemological conversation, because there's a lot more compatibility in some of these root understandings of what is being studied than is commonly acknowledged. And, you know, I think speaking for myself, I really think that there's so much to be gained in scholarship um, from having this sort of broader um, between method, between community, between research program conversation. Yeah, and yeah, just to... Totally, sorry. Yeah, so go ahead. Well, well just, just, I thought maybe, just to give an example of that, right, I totally agree with what Matteo just said, and, and here's a good example. So political psychology has a big debate in it about, you know, as it were, how many dimensions are the major patterns and ideologies organized along? Are they really organized on one dimension, or are they organized along multiple dimensions? And... Um, there are those, one of the most prominent political psychologists, influential political psychologists, John Joss, very forcefully argues that, you know, the really most powerful patterns in ideologies are organized on this one left-right spectrum, that that really exists across cultures, across countries, and it's rooted in some sort of deep fundamental psychological um, uh, binaries in, in the way people think about politics and society. Now, that, you can investigate that question partly through statistical and quantitative inquiry, but one other way in which you might, for example, challenge that view is by looking at how different the left-right spectrum, as it were, is in different societies. So there's a lots of new research on, on, say, for example, left and right in China that suggests that actually left and right in China is associated with a quite different combination of psychological traits and properties than left and right in the USA or in Britain is. So, you know, there you can use sort of qualitative um, interpretive sort of decoding style methodologies to actually feed into a debate that is also addressed by these kind of more statistical dimensional uh, uh, models. So yeah, I totally agree with what Matteo says. There is, there is real sort of cross-fertilization and overlap. And, and really part of Matteo's and my paper was saying we need a lot more of that. We need people to be engaging in those kind of cross-methodological and cross-disciplinary conversations much more. Yeah. Um, okay. One just quick point, just clarifying terminology, just to get clear what I'm asserting, but it's it's not super important, and I don't intend to get hung up on it. And then one thought on the um, um, uh, dimension construction of ideology is, yes, yeah, so we, we were sort of, I think, maybe slightly talking past each other with respect to um, one object of study versus multiple. Take an ideology as a broad sort of systems of political belief definition that everyone can get behind, then yeah, there's one object of study, which, as you say, different questions have asked of it. So I'll reformulate what I was saying as the, those two different questions um, inform each other much more than I think is the case, which feeds into your larger point about this being um, very fertile ground for cross-disciplinary approaches. Um, there is, though, I mean, so, you know, here's, here's, here's one, like, thought, though, about, like, is what we're fundamentally debating when we look at what conception, so agreeing that there is a sort of concept of ideology that everyone can get behind, when we're talking about the, the specific conception, like the details of how we, even just like how we visualize this thing, um, that there are some arguments, I think, that are quite strong um, that aren't around how many dimensions or what those dimensions are, but against using dimensions at 
all as our f foundational basis of understanding. So one would be dimensional approaches tend to implicitly assume uh, bipolarity. They tend to assume that the left-wing views are simply the exact opposite of right-wing views. So for instance, a common dimension um, that's proffered, just by way of example, is the size of government, where at one end of the spectrum you have small government, at the other end of the spectrum you have large government. But I would argue that's actually an overtly right-wing construction, that for the most part, conservatives are interested in small government in a way that liberals simply aren't about having big government. No one really is for big government. Um, it's, you know, I, I want people to have health care and stuff like that. And if government is a means of achieving that, cool. But if, um, you know, some French or German style regulated insurance system is the means of achieving that, cool. But that just speaks to a broader point that the, the underlying goals or values for different ideologies aren't just different locations along the same spectrum or um, different preferences with regard to the same object. Ideologies, different ideologies value different things centrally, and the relative salience of those things is different in different ideologies, and the understanding of what those things are is different in different ideologies. So if you look at the Brexit debate, it's not like there's one bunch of people who want democracy and one bunch who want not democracy. They just are emphasizing different elements of democracy, be it the equal access element, the procedural element, the outcome element. Um, and they would all identify very strongly as Democrats, but... Um, what they are meaning democracy to mean is quite different in those cases. And that sort of distinction isn't is not easily captured by a dimensional model. Now, that doesn't mean dimensional models have no value if for no other reason than, you know, that's what we're all walking around with in our heads. But there is, there is a fundamentally different conceptualization of the space um, that has advantages and disadvantages over dimensions. So that's a bit long. Go, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so if I can just say one thing. So I don't know that I disagree with anything you've just said, uh, but I, I do think that it's easy to read dimensional approaches of study of ideology as making ontological claims about the nature of ideology. And... You know, I'm a political scientist. Uh, I do work with ideology. I've read much of the, the quantitative uh, dimensional efforts by U.S. political scientists to operationalize ideology in a dimensional way. I think that, that that rarely is rooted in strong ontological claims about the nature of that dimensionality. Uh, in fact, it's almost always an epistemological choice, and it's almost always being used instrumentally in the service of trying to understand, for instance, the causal effect of ideologies on some other political outcome. Right. Uh, one, one thing that distinguishes the intellectual project that I see in, in you know, really careful constructivist and interpretivist work on the content of ideologies from more dimensional approaches is that often dimensional approaches to the study of ideology the the measurement and uh, you know dimensionalization of ideology is sort of a step in a research process that's trying to then link those ideologies to some additional extra outcome rather than being the sort of objective analysis itself. And I think that if you really pressed most political scientists in the U.S. on their dimensional models of ideology, um, they would probably end up in a in a place where they would argue it works good well enough for our purposes and it allows us to operationalize this very difficult inchoate concept in a sufficiently precise way or in a in a sufficient way to answer some really deep questions about how ideology intersects with other parts of the political arena. Um, I, I think there's some exceptions here as you know Jonathan argued there are certainly some psychologists who are making slightly more ontological claims. But even then, it's not really the dimensions which are sort of the ontological claim, but more there are certain cognitive mechanisms that are seen as being deeply rooted in the way we perceive the world. And dimensionalization is almost an artifact of that. 
Um, so, so I do think we need to bear that in mind when trying to think about the compatibility of these different approaches. Yeah, and no, look, that that's some... Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, but even with that in mind, yeah, what we have is um, a representation, a picture. Um, you know, Wittgenstein talks all the time about these images that we sort of overlay onto the world. I'm not... Yeah, n- nobody or is really saying this is in a deep ontological sense what ideology is. Ideology is is like this line on a graph that I'm not ascribing that view to anyone. Um, it, it's a question of like, um, you know, we, we do this all the time with um, so many things. So just off the top of my head, you know, I would watch Game of Thrones and I would categorize that as a fantasy genre, right? In other words, I'm saying that meets some image I have in my head of what, what, how I'm categorizing that thing. Um, and those images will always be imperfect and always creak and groan as you try to put them onto a reality that is just fundamentally far too complex for our brains to understand. Um, with that said, I do worry that there's a danger where the only images we have to overlay onto reality are dimensional ones, and the dimensional ones have virtues, um, the, the, um, let's call them conceptual ones, don't, um, and vice versa. And I, my, my point wouldn't be, I, I do, you know, make, arguments against a purely dimensional one. I'm not saying there aren't times when it isn't useful to have that model and to be working within that and to be sort of using that as your interpretive frame. I'm just making the point that it's not the only game in town as, 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 as an interpretive frame. So I very strongly agree with what Matter was just saying about how dimensions are really, you know, they're used for certain instrumental purposes and they're good for some purposes, they're not good for others. But I think the one way in which I strongly agree with what you were just saying, Toby, is that um, the not only do the dimensions guide thinking and analysis of ideology in certain directions, but there are definitely certain sort of um, normative judgments that get made in the way that those dimensions are described. So take, for example, um, the common description of uh, left and right ideologies as being about left ideologies are very pro-change and pro-equality, and right-wing ideologies are anti-change and uh, anti-equality, pro-inequality. Well, one problem with that is that it, the, the, the characterization of right-wing ideologies as being hostile to change is often very dubious. So, you know, conservative yes. policies in the, in the 1980s under Reagan and Thatcher were hugely transformative, for example. They radically changed many aspects of societies. And so that's a, there's, something really, there's something genuinely normatively questionable about characterizing ideologies or characterizing right-wing ideologies in those terms. Similarly, you know, in the Soviet Union or in China, left-wing ideologies actually tend to be the ones that are very hostile to change because the existing ruling system has set itself up as being in defense of equality, um, whether it is or whether it isn't is another question. So there are genuine, you know, although these things are instrumental tools, there are real questions about that, that we, can, we can and should ask about the kind of ways or latent forms of analysis and normative judgments that those those um, descriptions of the dimensions sometimes carry with them. Yeah, could I make a point about theories of change? Because I've just spent quite a bit of time talking about this on the podcast. So oh, <laughs> I would argue, um, and I don't know how far we want to get into the weeds of it, that um, when it, one of the things that does separate the main ideological traditions, and obviously there's variance within them, is how they visualize the process of social change. But they're they're visualizing different things, and it's not... Because they're not thinking about the same thing when they think about change. It's really hard to get it down to, like, a a, a pro-change versus anti-change spectrum, because they just see the thing differently. So for conservatives, their thinking is 
I'm just straightforwardly parroting Frieden here, by the way, is always constrained by the idea of an extra-human social order, that be it the laws of God, the class structure, the quote-unquote laws of economics, fundamentally constrain what is possible in that space. And so fun- change for them, positive change, is always a reversion to an underlying mean or process. But as you correctly say, they can be very radical in pursuing that reversion. Liberalism traditionally conceptual change as open-ended, spacious, charting new ground. And then, of course, there are socialist conceptualizations of change as essentially starting a clean slate, um, revolutionary conceptions of change. But the picture in all of their heads is different. And that's and that's not the only way you can ca- divide up the ideological space, but I would say that is actually a really good key to determining which like branch of the tree that you're on. And that, I don't know that, that that's easily captured in a dimensional model. That would be a sort of another example of my uneasiness with dimension, dimensional models as sort of not one option amongst many, but we're sort of the default option. So I, I, I actually agree with both of you on this. I, I just think that we need to distinguish between the ways in which dimensional models are being used in popular debate and are being interpreted and mobilized into conversations about ideology and the, the ways in which dimensional models are being used by, for instance, political scientists or scholars um, as part of research programs in which that's a, a measurement choice that ends up being functional without making any deeper claims about sort of the, the sort of ontological um, sort of truth of these dimensional models. Yeah, I think I just agree. I, I you know, I, I mean, I do, but I do think, Matt, I'm not sure if you were disagreeing with this, but I do think that the sorts of features we've been describing are problems in some scholarly work as well, right? That there is a genuine question mark to be raised about, for example, some of the characterizations of left and right, including within scholarly work. I mean, I think the problem is much deeper in ordinary political discourse. Um, But what I do agree with is, I mean, again, dimensions are tools. They're simplifications for certain purposes. And they're they're good for some purposes. they're, They're not good for others. And I think, you know, Toby, to, to your concerns, I mean, I think one thing I would say is, you know, yeah, the subtlety of the kind of dynamics of change that you were talking about a minute ago, you know, dimensional models aren't good at capturing that. But descriptions of kind of thick, subtle interpretations of content, they're not very good, or, or at least it, it, it's quite awkward to make those um, statistically testable, right? And it's not just about statistics. I mean, you know, linking them to very, very specific causal outcomes across a large population and different countries, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> That's hard to do with these very, very nuanced, thick, conceptually rich models as well. So different methodologies are good for different purposes. You know, they're capturing different forms of theoretical sophistication. Yes, and um, I'll add another element actually on the side of um, dimensionality, which is... Yeah, I mean, there's part of me that might want to slightly query the thing that... um, the, the, the move from dimensionality to a conceptual model is a move of increasing complexity. There's some conceptual models that are comparatively simple, and there's some dimensional models that are very complex. But yes, yes overall, for sure, for sure. overall, it is much harder to try and... Um, empiricize is that a word you, you know what i mean but like to to empirically study the sort of um conceptual ideology i'm talking about i think one other advantage dimensional models have is in my head they do much better when it comes to like aggregating policy preferences but then they do worse i mean at least in my view when it comes to like more values questions so if you want to think about what people think about change or about freedom or about democracy you, you, dimensional models do struggle a little there but if you want to know um what they think about abortion access you can fairly easily rank that as, you know, lines on a graph for how restrictive you would want it, or if you want to rank, you know, how much money should the government spend on fighting climate change, then a dimensional approach, that picture matches the reality 
much more neatly there. Yeah, so I mean, what one another way to think about this, and I and I feel that we are all arriving actually at a point of substantial agreement, uh, is that most of the time when I uh, and this is this is not universally true, and, and I take all of Jonathan's points that there are some really serious problems with the way that ideology is dimensionalized in some, for instance, political science work. But often the dimensional models of ideology are being used to treat ideology as an independent variable in political analysis, um, not a dependent variable. And in, in some of the thicker, more sort of content-rich, subtle understandings of ideology often are used to explore and manage ideology as the dependent variable of a particular sort of piece of, of scholarship. Um, and so I, I feel much more permissive with measurement error and using a dimensional model of ideology as a proxy for this rich content, um, contextually embedded set of ideas uh, when it's really just being used as some sort of placeholder in the act of trying to understand the effect of ideologies on. If I can add one more thing to that as well, I mean, here's one other very important advantage of dimensional approaches, which is that they make it much, much easier to collect data on the actual political attitudes and preferences and views, albeit in a fairly simplified form, but of very large numbers of people. One problem with not all, but a huge amount of what we might call conceptual or content-based or, you know, more interpretive work, is that it's no accident that it's tended to have a fairly elitist focus, right? It's focused on major intellectuals and their writings, documents by political elites and political platforms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's incredibly arduous. I mean, you can sometimes use focus groups, but short of focus groups or really detailed interviews, it, it, it's really arduous to collect lots of detailed information on the actual political attitudes of, of ordinary people, of ordinary citizens, through an interpretive conceptual um, approach. And, I, and I, Whereas the, the dimensional approaches are much, much more efficient at doing that. It, as I said, it's not impossible through other methods. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons why dimensional approaches hold sway over much political science work is that they really are using data from thousands of, of people. And that's really interesting to us as political scientists and social scientists. You know, it's, it's now, of course, elites are interesting too. Intellectuals are interesting too. But again, we're studying different things and different methodologies have different strengths and different weaknesses. And, I, and, you know, even when they're studying the same thing, again, I come back to this point that they tend to be asking slightly different questions and a, and a better and worse at asking and answering slightly different questions. Well, in fact, this is something where, um, I don't know if, if your listeners know this, Toby, but uh, Jonathan and I in, in our, our thinking and, and writing about ideology um, refer to and draw from one of your papers about surveying ideology in mass populations. Um, so I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about this exact, this exact thing. If I can, <laughs> if I can turn, turn the tables on you briefly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is undeniably more difficult to say, you know, I because I have to ask more questions, right, if I'm trying to get at what's your underlying conceptual framework. Now, what I will say is um um the models um that are developed by let's just take Michael Frieden right um the models that are developed by Michael Frieden are i believe much more simplifiable than many people including arguably Frieden himself actually think in that if i am giving you um what is liberal from a dimensional approach? Just let's take a really basic question. What is a liberal, right? Um, then actually from a dimensional approach, I say, well, a liberal is someone who believes in, um, you know, uh, education and healthcare being provided. And I'll, I'll sort of give you a list of bullet points of policy preferences, right? Which you can summarize as being left wing. Um, if I'm taking liberal in freedom's terms, I can say, a liberal is someone who believes that individuality means this, freedom means this, social progress means this. I can actually give you the description in almost as few words. You know, it does break down that, um, it does reduce to something that is, is certainly a simplification of all of the wonderful nuances of people like Frieden's work, but I'm not, I'm not, you can't survey people on that. And actually, 
it's not impossible to go and get a measure of just what do people understand particular concepts to mean. Now, it is harder, but it's not impossible. And I'm not the only person who's done this. Um, the uh, historical sociologist Orlando Patterson did an interesting study where he just went round and surveyed a thousand Americans and just asked the open-ended question, what do you understand freedom to be? And what are some instances you can give in your day-to-day -day life of when you felt free? Well, that's just like a, it's a very simple question, but that's just like a really interesting data set. And you can be interested in that data set both as a causal variable that then um, produces policy preferences, um, but you can just be interested in that data for its own sake. And I'd, I'd actually be somewhat cautious. You talked earlier about causality, of whether we view it as a um, dependent variable or not. As being somewhat cautious of the language of causality at all, to my mind, that like the operation of uh, values with policy preferences, the operation of um, ideology with outcomes, and then the world with ideology are all mutually informing in really difficult and complex ways. So yeah, that, that's a little bit of an, a, 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 an overview of my thinking on that. Um, yeah, no, that's very, very interesting. And I mean, I think one of the, it makes me think that one of the things that I think is worth emphasizing, because some of my comments, not either of your comments, but my comments could have, I think, been misleading at one level. It's important, of course, not to conflate dimensional approaches with, say, statistical or uh, large N survey. Exactly. Right? There, are, there, are exactly. Of, there are lots of approaches yes. that could use large amounts of data, even statistical data, but that don't really imply dimensions. You know, I mean, and indeed some versions of discourse analysis, content analysis, which really use, you know, big computer analysis of huge amounts of discursive data, say on Twitter, or on Facebook, can tell us a lot about ideology, even though they're not using a dimensional approach. So, so it's not as simple as that. But again, I still think it comes back to the point that different methodologies are, are telling us different things and should be used for, for, you know, or have strengths and weaknesses for addressing different kinds of questions. Yeah, I think, yes, exactly. And I think this is the point where people, like, call me a crazy postmodernist, but, like, it, you, you make value judgments and evaluative judgments before you start any empirical work, right? You, you, you make judgments about how you are conceptualizing your object of study that will then inform how data is collected and how results are interpreted. And there's no, you'll, you'll never get behind that to a point of pure objectivity in which you can just say, this is what ideology is and this is how we study it. And that doesn't imply a hard relativism. There are better and worse value judgments that we can make in conceptualizing what ideology is. But, I mean, just to be really like, you know, how we conceptualize what ideology is, is in itself going to be subtly and latently an ideological construct, you know? So I, 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 I mean, I, I think if there's one punchline we all keep coming back to, it's I do really believe that if you're going to be a serious political thinker, not merely someone who has political opinions and political preferences, you need to be bilingual and multilingual with regards to these sort of fundamental models of e what ideology is or what other key things are that you're bringing to the world. And you need to be able to, to be comfortable in all of them. Does that make sense? Yeah, very much so. And I, and I think also a related thought here is that, you know, part of the critical study of ideology, although, as I've said before, that doesn't need to be that ideology is intrinsically bad, but part of the critical study of ideology is about being opposed to certain reifications, right? Certain assumptions that a particular way of seeing the world or indeed dividing up ideologies themselves is somehow natural, right? That it's automatic. Okay, as we talked about earlier, there can be some, there are some psychological reasons to think that there might be some patterns. But, you know, really we need to be as, we need to recognize that many of the ways that we describe ideologies and describe the components of ideologies are themselves matters of disagreement. And, you know, re again, mapping disagreement, understanding disagreement, and understanding the foundations of disagreement is for me a big part of what the, not the only thing, but it's a big part of what the study of ideology is about.
Exactly. Um, and when I wrote that paper, which I, I read it, reread it recently, and I just was impressed by how bad my writing used to be. But I, I think I wrote that much more as like a proponent of a particular um, way of conceptualizing ideology, whereas I think now I would take a sort of more epistemically humble approach of just to say there are different ways of conceptualizing it and a, a, a mature student of ideologies should be comfortable switching between them and being honest about their respective advantages and disadvantages yeah i'd agree yeah me too okay so did, did we just like like reach a reach a um Conclusion there. Um, other, w- our, paper what else? About, our paper was all about convergences. I mean, also divergences, but convergences in the study of ideology. So this is a nice emphasis of the way in which we can all converge on common understanding. <laughs> uh, although this stuff, I wonder if some people have just listened to an hour of this and been like, what What the fuck was all of that about? Because <laughs> um, that, that was fairly... Uh, <laughs> Dense. Um, okay, um, that seems like a nice full stop to me. Are there any sort of final um, thoughts either of you? Um, um, we'll go to Matto first. Um, want to want to leave people with um, just any any final pickups from the conversation we've had, or any yeah any final thoughts? I'll just add one thing, um, and that I think there's another dimension, so to speak, if I can be permitted to use that <laughs> word. To this debate uh, that we haven't picked up on as much, but is at least worth pointing out. And that's that there's also a bit of a difference in the relationship of individuals to the group, in how ideologies are conceptualized and, and in sort of different forms of thinking about the role of ideology in political life. Um, and that's actually tended to also cluster with some of these other deeper divisions in the study of ideology that we've talked about. So it tends to be that people who take a more dimensional approach, people who are working more in sort of a quantitative uh, positivist tradition, have tended to be much more focused on uh, individuals and prioritizing individuals first. And and. and Increasingly, that literature is beginning to think about the relationship of individuals to the group. Whereas I actually think that people who have been working in more a discursive, interpretivist, constructivist way of thinking about ideology have almost, well, not almost, but have often been very focused on the group as sort of the primary object. So ideologies as being this like thing that networks and links groups of people together. And but I do think there's been a trend in recent years to move from the group to the individual. And, and so in some ways, I think that these two different communities are beginning to meet in the middle with a, a more thoughtful dialogue about the relationship of individuals and groups when it comes to ideology. Um, but they've sort of started on sort of different poles and, and sort of begun to, to come to a space where even if dialogue is not yet happening, there's probably a lot of fertile dialogue to be had. Um, and so I, I think that's at least something worth throwing out there um, as part of this conversation. No, that, that's really interesting, and I hadn't thought of that before, but now that you say it, that seems very obviously true, that the dimensional empiricist approach tends to be more individualistic. I don't think there's anything that means it necessarily has to be though, right? No, like, no none of this that, is necessary. That... It's all just been, a, I think, a, a function of the way that these communities have developed. Um, but I think that both communities have begun to recognize, you know, the individualists have begun to recognize the importance of the group, and the group-oriented individuals have recognized the importance of the individual. And so there is a convergence happening here that maybe isn't apparent if you just read certain sort of older works in ideology that have been written. Yeah, that that's so interesting. I mean, there's sort of like it seems to me like most people. No, this is this is a huge caricature that's maybe slightly offensive. It, it is it is quite common that people who are very very empirically minded are sort of underlying 
a lot of, even implicitly, a lot of their stuff with a sort of quote-unquote rational self-interest model. Um, but that's not super helpful in the study of ideology, because if you're going with like a pure rational self-interest model, it's actually quite hard to explain why people have ideological preferences at all, given that it's quite costly to acquire, maintain, and defend them, and they don't really seem to benefit the user. So if you're going with a a sort of classically economic homo economicus, I would argue, I mean, just like you said, you have to understand both the individual and the group and the relation between them. I hadn't thought of it before, but you, that, that seems so true now that you've said it. I would modify just one thing that you just said, Toby, which is that I think, um, I mean, I agree with you that I think that there is a sort of tradition of thinking about ideologies in a very homo economicus. I mean, actually, this is quite a Marxist way of thinking at a certain level, but certainly the dominant ideology, that the dominant ideology really just reflects the economic interests of the ruling class. But I think one of the things that we have learned a lot from psychological research is that there is a sort of broader self-interested a broader self-interest, which ideologies do serve, um, well, in fact, multiple of them, but certainly at a bare minimum, people need ideologies in order to navigate the world. And in fact, it's very much that because, you know, it is too arduous to go out and check everything. It's too arduous to kind of find all the accurate evidence about every single thing that we might be interested in about politics. You know, in modern societies, we can only experience a tiny fraction of the questions and issues and phenomena that are relevant for politics. And so actually, in a sense, ideologies fill the gaps for us. They provide the kind of map of political reality that orientates us. They provide narratives that make sense of the world around us. And from a sort of more psychological, less economic perspective, of course, that, that is, in a sense, serving our self-interest. And indeed, also one of the really important things that comes out more broadly from psychological research is that ideologies originate in part, or people are attracted towards certain ideologies, in part through motivated reasoning. That, you know, people find ideological positions attractive because they satisfy psychological needs and psychological desires at various levels. You know, for example, some people are really very intolerant of ambiguity. They find ambiguous answers to things distressing and find the uncertainty distressing. And so they're attracted to ideologies that provide a sense of certainty and confidence in the world around them. Other people are much more tolerant of uh, ambiguity, and so don't find that a particular attraction. So, although you're absolutely right that I think Homo economicus as a model does not give us much of a grip on ideologies, there are still, I think, you know, rational, in some bounded sense, reasons why people are drawn to ideologies and certain self interested motives that do drive that process of attachment. Oh, I completely agree. And listen, as a sort of um, someone who's very influenced by Frieden's work, I mean, part of what comes along for the ride is once you um, take that conceptual framework to heart, is a view of ideologies as, as not only like functionally necessary, but as important and in, in, enriching in some cases aspects of our lives and our relationships with others. So on a functional level, we need ideologies because even take a silly example, like you apply for a job that won't higher women, you're going to, you, you encounter these choices like this all the time, and you need, a, you need a mechanism for making sense of them and living in a community with others. And there's additional elements of ideology as, as bonding to groups and being part of a community and having a shared moral discourse that are hugely valuable and enriching. My, my point was much more limited in that if you just take the absolute parody of uh, individualist, positivist, rationalist thinker who, you know, is completely constrained by a view of human nature as um, egotistical, rational want fulfillment. That guy has a hard time thinking about um, uh, uh, ideology in a meaningful way. But like like you say, if you take a sort of a, a broader um uh, conception of self-interest that includes these social elements, then yes, absolutely it is in our interests to have uh, ideologies. That, that's right. And, and while we shouldn't think of ideologies as always sort of linked towards error or, you know, always being a source of mistake, certainly one of the most obvious reasons why we want to look at ideology is that often it's ideologies that help us explain behavior that does seem sort of irrational from a very simple homo economicus view. You know, why do state leaders do things that ultimately prove massively counterproductive for them? Why do certain sections of the electorate support policies that end up concretely harming them? These are often the kinds of questions that ideology uh, helps us answer. Yes. Yes, exactly. And th there's also a like... Um, 
and we're going over time, so I don't want to open a whole other rabbit hole. There's also, I think, as a, a sort of naively positivist view that reason and emotion are foundationally different things, and, you know, never the two shall meet. Whereas actually, like, it's just muddier than that. There's, like, so many elements, as we have been discussing, where, like, even the most overt empiricism will still be informed by these constructions, these models, these narratives that we have before we even set out to do any empirical work. And then once you get the empirical work back, it's like, well, well what does that mean and how do we interpret it? So, so to, I'm not going to be able to articulate like a full epistemic theory here, but when you're looking at the social and political world, the idea that you're ever going to be able to cleanly separate this is rational thought and this is emotionally guided thought is kind of reductive and a little naive almost, which is not to say that there will be some thought that is more rationally based than others or more emotionally based, but you're never going to get just one or the other clean like that. And it might not be desirable to do so. Emotions and emotional identity are a big part of what makes us human. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. I mean, and in fact, I would say that psychology has now pretty irrefutably denounced the view that emotion and rationality are some kind of completely opposed psychological forces. On the contrary, reason and emotion are distinct. They, they have distinct psychological properties and processes in the mind, but people can't make any decisions without both. And effectively, almost all uh, mental processes involve both emotion and rationality in various, in various forms and ways. So I think the idea that, you know, the, the, the idea that, that reason and emotion are deeply intertwined is now a completely consensus one, uh, pretty much. There, there's big disputes over how they're intertwined, but the notion that they go together is, is very commonplace in psychology. Yeah, I mean, that just seems obvious to me, but I think this is the point where, like, the moral philosopher is twitching and going, but does that mean I can't still be a moral realist, you know? Um, I think that that's the fear when we talk like that. Sure, yeah. Um, but we, we dismissed that a bit. All right, let's let's wrap up. Um, we ran over the hour a tiny bit. I really enjoyed that, guys. Thank you yeah, both so thanks, much for coming on. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks, Toby. Um, are there any... Um, I don't know if you guys are online, but is there any, like, Twitter handle or website you'd want to direct listeners to if they want to read your work? Uh, people can find me at jleedemaynard.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter as well, but all the, all the links to my various things are on there. So just jleedemaynard.com. Right. Okay. Yeah, and, and for myself, it's madamrosenberger.com, so it's very similar. Thank you for listening to the Political Philosophy Podcast. Next week, we'll go back to a more political philosophy topic and talk about ideal and non-ideal theory with Professor Jacob T. Levy, who'll be known to many of you. And that's a really interesting and fun, more philosophy side conversation. After that, I'm going to do my Machiavelli series, where I talk about the role of class conflict in Machiavelli. And I look, following up on this conversation, at the varying ideological uses to which Machiavelli has been put in recent political thought, and I use that to make some general comments about how we self-consciously approach the role of ideology on the high information far left. So those of us who are very, very left-wing and very, very, you know, into reading political news, how do we self-critically think about our own ideology? So that's going to be a multi-part series. I'm thinking three parts, and that'll come up after Professor Levy. After that, I'm quite open. I have some ideas, and I'll generally, with all of the ideas as they go forward, I'll put them to Twitter polls. Although, occasionally, I might just do an episode just because it's something that interests me. So yeah, that's what's coming up on the podcast. If you want to support this project, which brings conversations like this for free and advertisement free, so it's not interrupted, to tens of thousands of people, um, hopefully provides a valuable service. If you'd like to support that, you can do so by sponsoring us on Patreon. That's patreon.com stroke political philosophy podcast, patreon.com stroke political philosophy podcast. And you know, 
I've been suggesting $2 an episode, so if the episode that you just listened to was as refreshing and invigorating as a cup of coffee, or as bitter and unpalatable as a cup of coffee, depending on your preference, consider sponsoring it on that basis. It's really easy to do, always under your control, and it helps me have the funds to keep doing this, which is great. Apart from that, sharing episodes or forwarding them also always helps, and I'm genuinely grateful to anyone who does any of those things. I'm excited to keep bringing you these conversations, and I appreciate you for listening to this episode. Thank you so much. I hope you'll join us again next week. Mm